Okay, good evening, everybody. S is for serious Unitarians, and we'll start with a chalice lighting quote from Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr. If we are to survive, we must have ideas, vision, and courage. These things are rarely produced by committees. Everything that matters in our intellectual and moral life begins with an individual confronting his own mind and conscience in a room by himself. Arthur M. Schlesinger. And today we are covering government, and I'm glad that uh, Marjane is here to correct me if my Polish gets too far out of line, because we are starting in Poland in the Reformation. Um, a group of Unitarian Christians formed in Poland. We call them Socinians, because the books of Fausto Socini are our best source for their beliefs. But they called themselves the Polish Brethren, except in Polish, of course. In 1569, they got the support of a noble named Jan Sienienski. Is that going to survive Marjana? Can I say it like that? I will, anyway. Under his protection, they founded the town of Rakov as a utopian community. They built significant buildings like this assembly hall, and they had hundreds of members. A generation later in 1602, Jakub Sienienski founded the Rakovian Academy. Now that was a big deal. It had a busy printing press, scholarly professors, and eventually 1,000 students. Unitarians, Calvinists. Sorry, hello? Um, okay, I'm going to continue. Uh, yeah, the Rakovian Academy. It had a, eventually a thousand students and they took everybody, Unitarians, Calvinists, and Catholics studying together in a tolerant atmosphere created by the semi-famous Edict of Torda, uh, a very uh, tolerant, and relig uh, tolerant of religion in Poland at the time. Unfortunately, times were changing in Poland. There was a new king, and the toleration fostered by the Edict of Torda was fading. For Rakov, the trigger came in 1638. Two students disrespected local Catholics by throwing stones at a wooden crucifix in a public street. On this pretext, the Jesuits brought Jakob and the Academy's principal to trial. That's Sienienski on the left, the school principal on the right, and one of the stone-throwing twerps who got them in trouble in the middle. The academy was closed. Within 20 years, all Socinians were expelled from Poland. Some emigrated to the Netherlands and eventually to England, where they helped form our own British Unitarian tradition. And not far away, the Polish brethren were supported in Voing by three generations of the Sienuta family. I found three coats of arms on Polish language Wikipedia. I don't know which version is the 17th century. Uh, Voing is a big region. It straddles modern Poland and Ukraine, and it's spelled like that, W-O-L-Y-N. The family patriarch, Krzysztof Sienuta, played for every team during the Reformation. He was raised Calvinist in 1611 to keep a vow that he made during a serious illness. He converted to Catholicism. He spent the next year persecuting heretics. He replaced an Aryan church with a Catholic church run by Dominicans and thereby unintentionally created the bane of the Sienuta family for a century to come. Uh, because next, Christoph visited Rome. He was so scandalized by that city's impiety, he converted to Arianism. Back in Poland, he opened a new church for them. But the Edict of Torda made it illegal for him to throw the Dominicans out of the old church. And he did his best to make them feel unwelcome. He mocked them. He forbade them firewood. He put a blacksmith next to the Catholic church, perhaps hoping to burn it down. They sued him, he sued them, 
and the flood of legal battles continued for three lifetimes. When a Catholic king came to power in Poland, the, pre the Polish brethren declined. The Sienuta family fought a rearguard action for decades, losing in court, but finding ways to subvert the decisions in their towns and villages. The last case wasn't settled until the middle of the 18th century. And even today, the town of Tycomo refers to one old tower as the Aryan Tower. Jumping ahead to America and Joseph Story. At 32, Joseph Story became the youngest ever U.S. Supreme Court Justice. He served from 1812 to 45, most of it with Chief Justice John Marshall. Joseph wrote a dozen books, including Commentaries on the Constitution, which dominated constitutional law throughout the 1800s. By 1844, his annual royalties from the book were uh, more than twice his salary as a judge. Justice Story's written opinions for Marshall's court were very influential. They established the right of the U.S. Supreme Court to overrule state Supreme Courts. They interpreted the law to protect private property rights above all other rights. Actually a conservative stand not popular with most you use today. Uh, to balance that, Joseph wrote the decision in United States versus Amistad. He said the Africans aboard that slave ship were free and blameless men. They were not property and they were not murderers after they freed themselves at sea and killed the captain. Steven Spielberg told the story in his film Amistad. The part of Joseph's story was played by retired Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman. Lemuel Shaw was a Unitarian and the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court for 30 years, 1830 to 60. He is known for several cases touching on slavery and black rights and for a much studied summation that he gave to the jury in the Parkman Webster murder trial. But some you use remember him as the Unitarian who convicted a former Universalist, Abner Neeland, of blasphemy. The last blasphemy conviction ever in the United States. George Washington Stevens Sr. This guy is a Canadian, but he is not the most famous George Stevens, the president of the CPR. Our George was a Montreal lawyer and businessman. He was a city and provincial politician and a philanthropist. His political career was stunted because he refused to criticize Louis Riel. Robert Gould Shaw. He was the son of Francis George Shaw, a rich philanthropist and abolitionist whom we saw a month ago under Agents of Change. Robert was 23 years old and working in a family business on Staten Island when the Civil War began. Robert immediately joined the New York militia. But being from a prominent Boston family, within a month he was a second lieutenant on the second Massachusetts infantry. He fought at Winchester, Virginia and at the fiasco at Slaughter's Mountain and the bloody battle of Antietam. Late in 1862, urged on by his father, he took command of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. The 54th was America's first African-American regiment. He doubted his men's ability at first, but came to respect them. He was promoted to major on March 1863 and to colonel just 17 days later. In June 1863, Robert's regiment was raiding the coast of Georgia alongside the all-black regiment of Colonel James Montgomery. Montgomery ordered Shaw to burn undefended plantations. Shaw refused and instead wrote letters denouncing Montgomery for making war on civilians. I have to say as a guy who likes military history that that is a gray area. The Union war strategy was to harm the Confederate economy, so Montgomery's order was perhaps legal and proper. I mean, you don't stage a coastal raid just to hold a picnic. Still, it reflects well on Robert's morals and his goodwill. In his own way, Robert was something of a rebel. When he learned that 
black soldiers received less pay than white soldiers, he and his soldiers boycotted. They refused all pay until August 1863, when Congress gave them equal pay with full back pay. But Robert and many of his men did not live to celebrate that victory. On July 18, 1863, Robert led his men on a frontal assault on Fort Wagner on Morris Island, south of Charleston Harbor. The strategic aim was to close the port of Charleston and halt Confederate blockade running. Fighting was fierce, but the attack failed. Robert himself was killed. It would take another two months of naval bombardment to force the Confederates to abandon the fort. But although the regiment's charge was stopped at the wall, all Union and Confederate observers gained new respect for black Americans as soldiers. Reports of the battle led to increased recruitments of black in the North, which eventually reached 150,000 soldiers. And for the first time, the South treated captured blacks as prisoners of war, not as criminals. Now that's not to say that they treated them the same as whites. The Confederate General Johnson Haygood returned the bodies of other dead Union officers, but he said of Robert, and here I will use his exact words, even the offensive ones, he said, had he been in command of white troops, I should have given him an honorable, bur honorable burial. As it is, I shall bury him in the common trench with the niggers that fell with him, unquote. It was intended as an insult but Shaw's family took it as an honor. His father Francis wrote, quote, we would not have his body removed from where it lies, surrounded by his brave and devoted soldiers. We can imagine no holier place than that in which he lies, among his brave and devoted followers, nor wish him better company. What a bodyguard he has, unquote. The bodies from that grave were lady, later reburied, still in South Carolina, with gravestones marked unknown. But Robert is far from unknown. There is a cenotaph at Mount Auburn Cemetery, west of Boston, and a monument in Moravian Cemetery on Staten Island, and a Robert Gold Shaw Memorial at Beacon and Park Streets in Boston. And there's the 1989 film Glory, with Matthew Broderick, Denzel Washington, and Morgan Freeman. And the neighborhood of Shaw in Washington, D.C., a dozen blocks northeast of the White House, bears his name. Sir Robert Stout. Sir Robert Stout was born in Scotland. He attended scientific, religious, and political forums with his father and uncle from the age of 10 and developed a sophisticated understanding. He qualified as a teacher at age 13 and a surveyor at age 16. At 19, he emigrated to Dunedin, New Zealand for the Otago Gold Rush. The gold fields didn't want him as a surveyor, so he became a teacher, and then a lawyer, and then on to politics. The UUA biography site has a long and glowing article on him, and I have a, a hard time trying to summarize it. Throughout his life, he was active in freethinker associations and encouraged the use of individual conscience, actively opposing harassment on grounds of religion or censorship. In politics, he always followed his principles. He married at 32 and fathered six children. Robert's main claim to fame, he was twice, twice Premier of New Zealand and later Chief Justice of New Zealand, the only person to have held both jobs. As Premier, he passed the Married Women's Property Act which meant that brides no longer forfeited their property to their husbands. His support for suffragists helped their cause. In 1893, New Zealand became the first country to give women the vote, nine years ahead of the second, Australia. And at least 127 years ahead of the Vatican, which is the only remaining holdout. Uh, Saudi Arabia, by the way, uh, women first voted in local elections there in 2015, and that's what, they, they were second last. Uh, for his last 25 years, Robert was president of the Wellington Unitarian Free Church. 
Here's Henry Spencer back to Canada again. He was a Canadian politician. He was born in England and worked briefly as a publisher in Paris. He then came to Alberta and started a homestead many miles from the nearest, nearest railroad. At age 35, he was provincial secretary for the United Farmers of Alberta, a farmer's lobby that morphed into a provincial political party. In 1921, he won his riding and the UFA formed the government. He remained in parliament for 14 years as part of a radical caucus called the Ginger Group. He was a founding member of the CCF, which is now the NDP, in 1932. He lost his seat in 1935 and retired to British Columbia at age 62. Here's Reginald Sorensen, Baron Sorensen. He was a British Unitarian minister for life and a member of parliament for over 30 years. As a Labour Party MP in the 1930s, he was known for strong criticism of Britain's harsh rule in India. As a Unitarian minister in the 1960s, he was a strong secularist. He was an appointed lecturer at the South Place Ethical Society, which is the oldest surviving freethinker society in the world. Uh, Reginald gives us an opportunity to examine the second strangest mechanism in the British government. In 1964, 73-year-old Reginald was returned to his seat, but Foreign Secretary Patrick Walker was not returned to his seat. Now, the later Labour Party had to get Walker a seat in the House, so someone had to resign and allow a by-election. And they picked Reginald. However, a British MP who does not have a cabinet position is not allowed to resign. To get around this, Reginald was created a life peer. He became Baron Sorensen and was admitted to the House of Lords, where he served four years as a Lord in waiting. Since he was a political appointee requested by the government, he sat on the government side, where he acted as a whip. As another piece of trivia, the Queen also appoints lords in waiting of her own choosing, usually as a reward for long service as courtiers. They sit as crossbenchers between the government and the opposing uh, and the opposition benches. Oh, incidentally, Foreign Secretary Patrick Walker, he lost that by-election. I just hope he was a better statesman than a politician. In case you're wondering, the strangest mechanism in British government is the steward of the Chiltern Hundreds. British MPs are also allowed to resign if they are in the cabinet. Steward of the Chiltern Hundreds is an obsolete cabinet post, always kept vacant, except when a member asks to be specifically appointed for the purpose of resigning. Here is Leverett Saltonstall. He was a Boston Brahmin, in other words, Boston upper class. He was governor of Massachusetts during World War II and then a U.S. Senator from Massachusetts for over 20 years. He was a Republican, which was common for UUs in earlier times when Republicans were progressives. And he was liberal for a Republican. He was the only Republican Senator to vote for censure of Joseph McCarthy. He was a political moderate, good at compromise, and was liked by most members of both parties. Yeah, the good old days, yeah. Adlai Stevenson. Uh, his full name was Adlai Ewing Stevenson II, and he was a lifelong Unitarian. His grandfather, the, the first, was vice president for Grover Cleveland, uh, but he was not a Unitarian. Before age 48, Adlai worked as a lawyer and held a number of jobs in the public sector. A New Deal project, the Federal Alcohol Control Administration, the Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies, the Principal Attorney of the Secretary of the Navy, uh, and several years with the United Nations. In 1948, Adlai ran as a Democrat and became Governor of Illinois, defeating the incumbent Republican by a landslide half million votes. He was governor during the McCarthy era 
and vetoed a bill that tried to bring McCarthyism to Illinois. He said, does anyone seriously think that a real traitor will hesitate to sign a loyalty oath? Of course not. The whole notion of loyalty oaths is a natural characteristic of the police state, not of democracy. Adlai was quotable. He opposed McCarthyism with quotes like, we must not burn down the house to kill the rats. And my definition of a free society is a society where it is safe to be unpopular. He coined a saying, which has been wrongly attributed to both Abraham Lincoln and Mae West, it is not the years in your life, but the life in your years that count. Adlai's career as governor reminds us that he was a winner, but he is best known as a two-time loser. He was the Democrat presidential candidate in 1952 and 1956, running against D-Day Supreme Commander Ike Eisenhower. Adlai was a hardworking candidate, as captured in this famous worn-out shoe photograph by Flint Journal photographer Bill Gallagher. The photo helped change a negative perception of Adlai as an aristocratic egghead out of touch with common Americans. The Democrats knew they were onto a good thing and they pushed the shoe symbolism hard, but it was not enough. Asked in 1960 for advice to young politicians, Adlai said, never run against a war hero. Adlai remained a public figure and continued to bring his liberal values to American politics until his early death in 1965. A quote, I think that one of our most important tasks is to convince others that there's nothing to fear in difference, that difference in fact is one of the healthiest and most invigorating of human characteristics without which life would become meaningless. Here lies the power of the liberal way not in making the whole world Unitarian, but in helping ourselves and others to see some of the possibilities inherent in viewpoints other than one's own, in encouraging the free interchange of ideas, in welcoming fresh approaches to the problems of life, and urging the fullest, most vigorous use of critical self-examination." Unquote. And here's Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr. Some of you will remember him as one of the top aides in the Kennedy White House and a best-selling White House biographer. His paternal grandparents were a Prussian Jew and an Austrian Catholic who converted to Protestantism and immigrated together to Ohio. His mother, Elizabeth Bancroft, was a Unitarian and Arthur was raised in Boston in that faith before becoming a freethinker, atheist, as an adult. I can't find any record that Arthur Sr. was Unitarian, but I will call him a fellow traveler with the Unitarians. One time in Boston, Unitarian Margaret Sanger was warned that she'd be arrested if she spoke in public about birth control. So she stood on stage with a gag on her mouth while Arthur Sr. read her speech for her. I really would love to claim him, he was an important historian and intellectual of the progressive era and famous. Our Arthur was born Arthur Bancroft Schlesinger, but changed his last name to Arthur, changed his name to Arthur Meyer Schlesinger Jr. to match his father's. Like his father, our Arthur was a Harvard historian, social critic, and public intellectual. His specialty was the study of liberalism in 20th century America. His political activism began in 1947 when he co-founded the grassroots lobby group Americans for Democratic Action with former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and up-and-coming Minneapolis Mayor Hubert Humphrey and economist John Kenneth Galbraith and theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, the ADA has 67,000 members today. Arthur was the major speechwriter for Adlai Stevenson in the 1950s, so perhaps he is really the quotable one. From 1961 to 63, he was a, quote, sort of roving reporter and troubleshooter, unquote, for President Kennedy, whom he'd known at Harvard. 
He specialized in Latin American affairs and was one of the few opponents to the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. Kennedy joked, quote, he wrote me a memorandum that will make him look pretty good when he gets around to writing his book on my administration. Only, he better not publish that memorandum while I'm still alive, unquote. Well, Arthur did write a Kennedy biography, 1,000 1, 1, Days, and wrote the 1966 Pulitzer, and won the 1966 Pulitzer Prize for biography. He supported Robert Kennedy's campaign and wrote his biography, at the request of Robert's wife. And he wrote an unflattering account of the new presidential powers claimed under the Nixon administration called Imperial Presidency. Schlesinger was one of the names on Nixon's famous en enemies list. By coincidence, he was also Nixon's back fence neighbor on New York's Upper East Side from 1979 to 81. Uh, if you like uh, Arthur's writing, you are in luck. His total output is nearly ridiculous. He gave his name to 56 books in his popularized history series, World Leaders, Past and Present, and he wrote 32 other books as well. The Age of Jackson, written in 1945, won him another Pulitzer Prize. And here comes Richard A. Snelling. He was a descendant of one of Vermont's oldest business and political families. His father was raised Quaker, and I'm not sure when Richard became Unitarian. It may have been at Harvard, where he graduated in 1948 with a BA in government and economics. Richard was a business, uh, businessman and a Republican. He was governor of Vermont from 1977 to 85. He was elected again in 1990 and died in office of a heart attack. Ted Sorensen, Theodore Chaikin Sorensen. Uh, we have not accidentally returned to Schlesinger. This is Ted Sorensen, top legal advisor in the Kennedy White House, main speechwriter for John F. Kennedy, and a best selling White House biographer. Kennedy once called him, quote, his intellectual blood bank, unquote. Ted was a co writer for Ken Kennedy's best selling book, Profiles in Courage. Most authors and commentators over the year have credited him with coining, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Ted himself says he can't remember after all this time, and the line is probably Kennedy's own. Ted was devastated by Kennedy's assassination. He stayed on to write Lyndon Johnson's first speeches, but resigned early in 1964. Schlesinger and Sorensen are not the first UU Kennedy aides that we've seen in our March Through the Alphabet. Since Kennedy was Catholic, I think it must be the, that the common link was Harvard. Here is Adlai's son, Adlai Ewing Stevenson III, also raised Unitarian, and the Wikipedia still lists him as UU. Like his father, he attended Harvard and became an Illinois politician in his case, a U.S. Senator from Illinois for 10 years. After leaving politics at the age of 51, he engaged in business and nonprofit activities in East Asia, in Japan, Korea, and China. He is chairman of SCNM Investment Corporation and co-chairman of Hua Mei Capital Company, the first Chinese American investment bank. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing Hua Mei, Depending on how it's accented, it can mean a songbird or a pickled plum or the intended meaning China slash USA. It's also the name of a panda born at the San Diego Zoo. In case you are wondering, there is an Adlai Ewing Stevenson V born in 1994. I don't know the religions of fourth and fifth. Uh, I put up this paperback copy of the fifth head of Cerberus because that is about uh, a five generation family. Uh, no Unitarian connection, but I did definitely enjoy the book. Pete Stark was a U.S. congressman from California for 40 years, 1973 to 2013. 
Pete was the first openly atheist member of Congress and one of the few you use. Wikipedia lists many controversial statements from Pete. Here's a notable example. Quote, I am just amazed that the Republicans are worried that we can't pay for insuring an additional 10 million children. Republicans sure don't care about finding 200 billion to fight the illegal war in Iraq. Where are you, are you going to get that money? Are you going to tell us lies like you're telling us today? Is that how you're going to fund the war? You don't have money to fund the war or children, but you're going to spend it to blow up innocent people if we can get enough kids to grow old enough for you to send to Iraq to get their heads blown off for the president's amusement." Unquote. A couple of less noble examples. When told to shut up at a committee meeting in 2003, he said, you think you are big enough to make me, you little wimp? Come on, come on over here and make me, I dare you, you little fruitcake, unquote. To a reporter who was pressing him for uncomfortable answers on the national debt, quote, you get the bleep out of here or I'll throw you out of the window, unquote. In 2009, on a town hall on health care, a constituent said, Mr. Congressman, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. Stark answered, I wouldn't dignify you by peeing on your leg. It wouldn't be worth wasting the urine. Well, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure that I could do politics for 40 years without using language like that. Uh, nothing makes you feel old like updating your biography database. Pete was still alive the last time I gave this talk. He moved to Maryland after retirement and died at home of leukemia in January 2020. And that is the end of our government section.